Okay, well, uh, today I wanted to read through a passage from 1 Peter. We're just going to kind of go through uh, most of chapter 1. If you haven't read 1 Peter in a while, it is uh, absolutely incredible. And it is so relevant to us today, as I believe you're going to see. And uh, I've been going through sort of a verse-by-verse -verse, uh, deep study in First Peter uh, with 119 Ministries, and that will begin to be released pretty soon here. Uh, this is going to be kind of like a very condensed version of um, some of those studies. But this is an amazing letter. Um, Peter's letter teaches us um, many valuable lessons. It teaches us all about our identity in Messiah, it teaches us all about the hope that we have in the midst of trials. And Peter gives us a proper perspective for how we should see our current situation in light of God's greater plan. He teaches us how we see, how we are to see our current situation in light of God's greater plan. And these are things that I think we need to be reminded of today because so often, and I see it so often, especially in uh, the time we live today, that we just become distracted by the world and we become distracted by the trials of life and everything going on that we fail to see the bigger picture of what God is doing. And so that is something that Peter wants to remind us of today. So with that, let's begin in verse 1 of First Peter chapter 1 says, Peter, an apostle of Yeshua the Messiah, Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for uh, sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Okay, so Peter begins this letter by introducing himself. Peter uh, is one of the 12 disciples of Yeshua the Messiah, obviously. And here, he introduces himself as an apostle. What is an apostle? Well, an apostle, basically, uh, it, it means a representative. It means someone sent on a mission as a representative. So Peter is an apostle of Yeshua the Messiah. He's a representative for the Messiah, writing to various Christian communities to instruct them and encourage them about various things. So why was it important that a representative for the Messiah write to these communities? A representative for, for the Messiah felt led by the Spirit to write to these communities. Why? Well, let's start by identifying who Peter's original readers were. Uh, he says, quote, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Okay, so Peter, he identifies his readers as elect exiles of the dispersion. This is interesting. Really quick, um, there are features of Peter's letter that have led many to believe that his audience was primarily made up of Jewish believers in Yeshua. And there were um, probably Jewish believers in Yeshua among his audience. But because of the language Peter uses, that's what a lot of people assume. Like, well, he must be talking to Jewish believers. For instance, Exile is a prominent theme throughout the letter. Peter describes his readers as exiles in that verse we just read and also uh, throughout the epistle. He tells them to, quote, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile in uh, verse 17 of chapter 1. He uses words such as dispersion, as we read, and he describes Rome, where he was, as Babylon in chapter 5. Um, sort of reinforcing this exilic motif. So because of these, uh, this language, he also describes his audience as, as uh, with terms, with terminology that is applied to Israel in the Old Testament. So because of this, a lot of people think he must be talking about Jewish believers. However, 
it's more likely that Peter's audience was mostly made up of Gentile believers just because of the regions that they were in. And, and also, uh, for instance, Peter describes his readers' former life as one of ignorance and futility inherited by their forefathers, as in uh, chapter, uh, verse 14 and 18. So because of this, um, this indicates a people who were not from a Jewish background. He's describing them as uh, having a former life of ignorance and futility inherited by their forefathers. So these weren't Jews, religious Jews, that grew up in the synagogue you know, going to uh, Sabbath services every week, learning the scriptures. These are people that have um, begun to follow the God of Israel later on in life. So why does Peter use this exilic motif? Why does he use this language identifying his readers as the same language that is used of Israel in the Old Testament? Well, I would submit to you that Peter's use of this exilic motif is actually strategic. It's a strategic way that he identifies his readers with Israel. What he wants to do is he wants to help them see that they are part of Abraham's family through the Messiah. As such, they too are exiles along with Israel. They are given the same mission as Israel, and they have the same hope for the future. So Peter wants to convey to his audience that they are part of Israel. They are part of God's family. Peter wants his readers also to see themselves as exiles. He calls them elect exiles of the dispersion. They are living in a land not their own, and Peter's readers probably felt a lot like exiles. They were facing major persecution in their communities at this time. It hadn't yet gotten to the point um, where they were being officially targeted by the Roman Empire for persecution. That happened a little bit later. But it was building up to that. They were being slandered. When we read through the letter, we see that they were being slandered. They were being excluded and marginalized and maligned all because of their identity as Christians, all because of what they believed and how they lived. The surrounding culture persecuted them. Peter goes on to say that his audience is chosen, quote, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Okay, so they are elect exiles According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, they are chosen by God in accordance with his purposes. So Peter, he wants to remind his audience that despite how bad their situation might seem, they aren't there by mistake. God has a plan for them. And this is unpacked a little bit more uh, in verses 3 through 13, which we'll get to in a little bit. But first, I want to talk about this exilic motif a little bit more, this theme of exile a little bit more. Peter wants his audience to see themselves as exiles. Why? Well, as we keep going, I think you're going to see just how relevant this message is for, t for us today. Because like Peter's original audience, we are living in a type of exile, aren't we? We are living in a type of exile. We are sojourners in a land not our own, surrounded by a culture that is often hostile to our beliefs and is often hostile to how we live. Society disparages, maligns, and excludes us because of our identity as Christians, just like the culture surrounding Peter's original audience excluded, maligned, and disparaged them because of their identity as Christians. Have you ever heard of cancel culture? Okay. <laughs> well, if you don't know, uh, basically, cancel culture is when someone expresses an unpopular opinion, 
which results in a mob of outraged people canceling them. And, and often canceling them takes the form of calling for the person to be fired from their job or um, calling for them to be removed from social media and, and those types of things. It's a type of social ostracism, okay? It's a type of social exclusion, okay? Much of the time, it's some celebrity who has failed to adhere to society's ever-changing cultural trends. Some celebrity has uh, not appropriately celebrated the latest letter that we added to the LGBTQ plus movement. And so they are canceled, all right? They're, they're um, excluded and maligned. But regular people like us have been victims of the online mob too. Um, recently, there was a major book publisher that removed books written by Christian and um, conservative authors because they challenged the uh, prevailing cultural narrative regarding things like transgenderism. So cancel culture is an attempt to silence and punish those who dare hold to unpopular ideas. Well, as followers of Yeshua, who believe the Bible, we hold many unpopular beliefs, don't we? We have many unpopular ideas. Modern secular culture is hostile toward our convictions regarding things like life, gender, and marriage. Modern secular culture doesn't like that we say that a baby in the womb is a human person deserving of the right to life and you shouldn't execute them. Modern secular culture doesn't like the fact that we say men are not women, like two plus two equals four. They promote the sort of neo-Gnosticism that says, oh, you can ascend beyond your physical limitations and be whatever gender you want. They don't like the fact that we say, no, men are men and women are women. They don't like the fact that we say marriage is a heterosexual union by definition. They don't like the fact that we agree with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. that we ought to judge each other based on the content of our character and not based on the color of our skin. Modern secular culture wants to create a hierarchy of races. They want to divide us based on group identity according to race and pit us against each other as oppressors and oppressed. Critical race theory. They don't like that we promote that we ought to love our neighbor as ourselves and that we are all equal in value and worth as people created in God's image. If you hold to Christian values regarding these issues, you will be called a bigot. You may lose friends. You may lose professional opportunities. You may be kicked off of social media. Being a follower of Messiah today is not trendy. Like Peter's original audience, Christians today face social exclusion and contempt because of what we stand for. And like his original audience, we know we don't really fit in here. We don't really fit in this world. But while society does slander and exclude us, Peter reminds us that we are not excluded from God's family. We are called his elect. We have an identity and a family and a purpose because of who we are in the Messiah. And also we have a glorious hope as we'll continue to see here. 1 Peter 1, starting in verse 3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. 
Okay, so Peter says we are born again to a living hope. What does that mean? What does Peter mean when he says that God has caused us to be born again? Well, throughout his letter, Peter uses the metaphor of family. We relate to God, quote, as obedient children in verse 14. We, quote, call on him as father in verse 17. So the idea that Peter wishes to convey here is that we've experienced a type of new birth when we received the Messiah as Savior and Lord. We became God's children. Our status changed. We were born into God's family. This is the result of Messiah's resurrection, which has inaugurated a new creation that will one day reach its climax at the end of the age, as we read in Peter's second epistle, and as we read at the end of Revelation, that there's going to be a new creation, there's going to be a new heavens and new earth. And so our new birth is part of that um, new creation, if you will. It's the beginning part of that new creation, which will eventually climax into the new heavens and new earth that will be ushered in at uh, the end of the age. So through Yeshua's resurrection, we've been born again, quote, to a living hope. That is to say, we have hope. The Messiah's resurrection from the dead assures us that there will be a future resurrection of all God's people at the end of the age. We have hope in God for the future because we've seen that God's promise of resurrection is trustworthy. We've seen that because God raised Yeshua from the dead, we've seen that his promise is trustworthy and we can have hope for the future that there will be a resurrection. Our new birth includes, quote, an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. So as believers who have been born into God's family through the resurrection, we have an inheritance. What is our inheritance? Our inheritance is eternal life, and it's God's kingdom. Peter says this inheritance is imperishable. What does that mean? It means it does not die. It is undefiled. It cannot be corrupted. It cannot be spoiled by the world. It's pure. It's unfading. It will not lose its worth. It's eternal. Finally, it's kept in heaven. What does that mean? It means that God himself keeps this inheritance safe for us. No one can take it away from us. God himself keeps it in heaven for us until we receive it fully at the end of the age. Finally, God's protection is for, quote, a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So because of the Messiah's work, we will be saved at the end of the age. That is the promise. That's the inheritance that we received as God's children who have been born into his family through Messiah's resurrection, through receiving that We have that promise. We have that hope. What a glorious hope that we've been born into. Let's continue. Verse 6. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Yeshua the Messiah. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So Peter says, in this you rejoice. We rejoice in what? Everything he just talked about, right? We rejoice in God's mercy that has caused us to be born again to a living hope. We rejoice because we have the assurance of eternal life that we've inherited through the Messiah's resurrection. We rejoice even though we, quote, have been grieved by various trials. So we, we rejoice in spite of the fact that we've been grieved by various trials. In spite of all of the current events that point to fear 
and gloom. Followers of Yeshua respond properly by rejoicing. Even though the present situation might seem bleak, it might seem hopeless, we know how the story is going to end, right? The living hope we've been born into through Yeshua's resurrection prompts us to rejoice because we have hope. We know that God's promises are true. We know there will be a future resurrection. Additionally, and paradoxically, the trials we endure are for our good. What the heck does that mean? The trials we endure are for our good, according to Peter. So not only do, or do we uh, rejoice in spite of our trials because we have a hope for a glorious future, but we rejoice because the trials are somehow paradoxically for our good. Trials test the sincerity of our faith. They test the genuineness of our faith, Peter says, so that we may be unhindered in our praise when Yeshua returns. To demonstrate how trials test our faith, Peter gives the analogy of refining gold with fire. Um, so, you know, precious metals such as gold, they were melted with fire to do what? To purify it, to remove the impurities. So Peter's point is that God uses trials for our sanctification. God uses trials to make our faith like a pure metal. Trials refine the character of our faith. They, they remove the impurities from us as the, the song that we were just singing before I came up here uh, proclaimed. Like many of you, I've personally experienced Many trials, I'm personally experiencing many trials right now in my own life. And I can say it's easy to just want to rail against all the external forces in the world that have caused me problems. It's easy to focus on all of that. It's tempting to be angry at everyone and everything else and to focus on how everything and everyone else needs to change so that things could be better. I've recently come to realize that God is using these trials because I'm the one who needs to change in many ways. God is refining my faith through the trials that I'm facing. He is teaching me through these trials to be less selfish, to be more patient, to be more compassionate, to be more understanding, the, this impurity in my life of selfishness, because I'm a very selfish person. I'm a very lazy person in many ways. I'm a, I'm a very not understanding person and not compassionate person. And God is teaching me that those things need to be refined, that my faith and my character in the Messiah needs to be refined. So he's using trials to do that. And he uses trials to do that in many ways, and somehow it works. Peter then goes on to describe his audience as um, loving and believing in the Messiah despite not seeing him. They, he said, even though you do not see him, you love him, you believe in him. So, in fact, even though they don't see him, he goes one step further. He says, they, quote, rejoice with joy that is inexpressible. It's an inexpressible joy that they have despite the fact that they can't see the Messiah right now. So their joy is not based on what they see. Their joy is not based on what they see. It's not based on the present difficult circumstances of life. Why? Why? Because they see beyond that. They see a reality that transcends the present circumstances of life. They see their present circumstances of life, the difficult things they're going through, in light of the glorious future that awaits them, in light of the transformation going on inside them, in light of the bigger picture of what God is doing. So believers can have an enduring joy regardless of suffering because of the living hope that we've been born into as God's children. Let's keep going. Verse 10, 
Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. So here, Peter says that the prophets looked forward to what he's now explaining to his audience. He says the prophets looked forward to the salvation that Peter's audience now possess. This message that the prophets predicted is what was announced to Peter's audience through those who preached the gospel to them through the Holy Spirit. The realities of the gospel now revealed to Peter's audience was the very thing that even angels are curious about. So what's Peter's point here? What's Peter's point here? His point is that his readers are in a position of privilege above even the prophets and angels. That if the prophets could see the the culmination of God's message that that they only got glimpses of, that they only got um, uh, a, a dim reflection of, In the Old Testament, the reality, the culmination of everything God spoke through the prophets is now readily available. It's now now come to, um, to pass, to fulfillment through the Messiah. That if the prophets were able to see what Peter's audience now sees and what we now see, they would be utterly amazed. And we're in a... And we because we can read Peter's letter, because we can read the Gospels in the New Testament, we are in that position of privilege as well, above even angels, to be able to see these things coming to pass. It's the culmination of God's entire story of plan, uh, God's entire plan of redemption. Peter ends this section by saying this, in 1 Peter 1, starting in verse 13, He says, therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Yeshua the Messiah. Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Yeshua the Messiah. That is what we set our hope on. And we are to prepare our minds for action and be sober-minded as we set our hope on that future glorious day. So we've been talking, we've been talking about hope, right? We've been talking about the hope we have as believers, the hope we've been born into. According to Peter, it's a hope that empowers us with an inexpressible joy. The hope that we have as believers, it empowers us with an inexpressible joy. What does that mean? It's a transcendent joy that we can't express. It's a joy that doesn't make sense to the world. It's a joy that isn't dependent on earthly circumstances. It's a joy that only believers in Yeshua can genuinely experience. Why? Because if there is no God, the suffering we endure in this life is meaningless. There is no greater purpose to it. There is no ultimate resolution It just makes us miserable. But since we do know God, and since we have hope in God because because of the resurrection, we know the glorious truth of the gospel and how the story will end. And so we can rejoice in spite of suffering and persecution. As Ecclesiastes says at the very end of the book of Ecclesiastes, The author says, one day God will bring every deed into judgment in chapter 12. This is the the conclusion of the entire matter. What does he say? He says that uh, this is the end of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the entire duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment, even every secret thing. So, what is, what, what is Ecclesiastes all about, right? The author is pretty much complaining the entire time. He's saying, like, what's up with all of these things that don't make sense in the world? What's up with the fact that 
The righteous suffer, and the wicked so often seem to prosper. Well, the conclusion is that God will one day bring every deed into judgment. God will one day bring about real justice in the world to come. And it's this hope that fuels how we live before God today. Fear God and keep his commandments. Even though life doesn't make any sense. Even though the wicked so often seem to prosper and the righteous so often seem to suffer. One day God will bring every deed into judgment. So fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man God will bring about true justice. We see everything in life, in light of the world to come. How often do you get discouraged over the state of our current world? I do. My answer would probably be every day. For instance, (laughs) it's easy. It's easy to give in to despair when we see the utter corruption of our political leadership. It's easy to get depressed, for example, when the candidate we voted for loses and the one we didn't vote for now enacting all kinds of immoral and destructive policies. It's easy to get discouraged when we see the increasing wickedness and the growing hostility in the culture toward believers. Nevertheless, despite all of that, we rejoice. How crazy is that? We rejoice. Why? Because our hope is not found in political leaders or the things of this world. Donald Trump is not my savior. He's not going to come back on wings of angels and, you know, saying, fake news, I've come to save you all. I can't do his his (laughs) voice very good, but... (laughs) My faith is not in Donald Trump. It's not in the Republican Party. It's not in the things of this world. Despite what's going on in the world today, we have hope because there is a greater kingdom to come. There is a greater kingdom to come. Evil will not prevail. God God will set all things right in the end. Some of you are experiencing trials on a more personal level, like me. When we experience loss of some kind, when we face trials in our relationships, when those whom we love betray or abandon us or hurt us in some way, it's so easy to allow the despair of that present situation to consume us isn't it? It's so easy to focus only on what we can see in the here and now. But as believers, we live in light of the world to come. We recognize that despite what's going on, there is hope for a glorious future, and there is hope even for right now because paradoxically, God is using that to transform us and change us and purify us The trials you face right now will someday be eclipsed by the glory of the world to come, which you've inherited through the Messiah's resurrection. In the meantime, the trials are for your good. They're a tool that God is using to refine you. God is more concerned about our character than our comfort. So as we face trials, we can ask God, what are you teaching me, Lord? Reveal to me, God, anything in my life that hinders me from being everything you created me to be. The rest of Peter's letter um, contains basically just a bunch of instructions on how we are to live in this exile as we await the coming kingdom. Peter goes on to say that we are to live holy lives. He says, starting in verse 14, he says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So as we 
await the coming kingdom, we live holy lives. I just note here that Peter appeals to the scriptures as his authority. He says, it is written. You are to be holy in all your conduct because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. This command to be holy is found in the Torah. Read Leviticus. It's found in Leviticus. Peter's definition of what it means to be holy is based on the Torah. The Torah defines holy behavior for us. Leviticus 19, at the very beginning of that chapter, it has this commandment, to be holy as God is holy. It includes commandments like honor your father and mother. It includes commandments like love your neighbor. It includes commandments like pursue justice and uh, don't judge unjustly. It also includes things like keep the Sabbath and don't eat unclean animals. Leviticus 11 also contains this commandment to be holy for he is holy. We are to be holy in all our conduct, according to Peter. We should be holy also in days, on the days which we rest and on what we eat. But the bottom line is that Christians are to be characterized by holiness, and Peter's definition of what that looks like is based on the scriptures he quoted from. Additionally, Peter directly calls us to engage the culture. That is another thing that we are called to do as elect exiles in the dispersion awaiting the coming kingdom. We are to engage the culture. Too many believers want to just tell the world to go to hell. They just want to buy buckets of grain and hide out in the woods until the Messiah comes back. That's not what we're called to do. Peter says we are to try to persuade people toward the truth using reason and argument. He says in 1 Peter 3, starting in verse 14, he says, But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. You're blessed when you suffer for righteousness' sake. Exactly what Yeshua said. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Some of you have said, heard me say this many times, but the word defense in that passage is the Greek word apologia, from which we get the word apologetics. So another way that we live in this time of exile is by engaging in apologetics. What's apologetics? It's knowing what you believe, why you believe it, being able to answer objections from skeptics and critics in the culture. So we need to become equipped with the knowledge and ability to answer objections from those who challenge our faith. We need to be able to know how to answer objections from the culture, from the LGBTQ activists. We need to learn, know how to answer objections from secular humanists and atheists and people in false religions so that they can be persuaded toward the truth as we explain the hope that we have within us, a hope that transcends the current world. We don't have to be like... Our, our hope is not in politics. Our hope is not in... We can explain to people that our hope is not in the, the correct political candidates getting into office and, and fixing everything. Like progressive leftism. That, that's their religion. Leftism today, it's their religion. We have to bring about a utopia by getting the right politicians in office and for them to enact all the policies that we want. It's not going to fix everything especially their ideas. But we have a hope that transcends that, and we can explain that hope, and we can persuade people that there is a reality that transcends this, that there is a hope for a glorious future within us that you can grab onto as well. You can be born into this hope through the Messiah's resurrection. You can be God's child, you can receive this inheritance of eternal life and the kingdom of God. So we need to become equipped 
with the knowledge and ability to be able to do that. And we also need to do it with gentleness and respect, as Peter says, in love and concern, because we do love our neighbor. We don't, we don't want the world to just go to hell. We want to, to, for people to repent. We want for people to come to the saving knowledge of Yeshua the Messiah. That's how we change the world. I'd encourage you guys to, um, to do a study through 1 Peter because it really does speak a lot to our situation today. And um, I hope you all are encouraged um, by this message and as you study on your own. I, I hope that you're encouraged and empowered uh, to live holy lives in the midst of your exile. You are an elect exile you are part of God's family. You've been born again to a living hope. And God is preparing you for that day when his kingdom arrives in fullness. In the meantime, we rejoice. We stand firm on the truth of the, of the gospel. We look forward to that day and we live holy lives for his glory. You guys pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much that your word is, is, is so relevant to us, that, that this letter written 2,000 years ago is still just as relevant to them, uh, to us as it was to them. And so God, I just ask that you would restore our hope if we've lost it, that as we've become discouraged by current events, as we've become discouraged because of the trials that we've experienced in our own lives. Lord, that there is a hope for a glorious future. And Father, I pray that you would help us to live in light of that hope, that we would rejoice in spite of what's going on in the world and in our lives. And Father, I ask that as we sang earlier before I got up here, um, I ask that you would purify us, that you would remove the impurities from our faith, from our character. God, that we can be transformed, that we can be made like a pure metal, like pure gold, unhindered from everything that you want us to be, Lord. And help us, Father, to be able to be a light to the world that through our love and through our humility and through the hope that we have, God, that it would be contagious to the world, that the, wor that the culture would, be, would want to know why we have this hope within us and we would be able to explain to them and reason with them and that your love would touch them, Lord, through our testimony and through the way we live our lives. God, we love you, we bless you, we praise you. In your son Yeshua's name, amen. Amen. Do you guys mind if I close us out with the ironic blessing? All right. It's a blessing for me to do this, so I, I pray that you all are blessed by it. Yevarecha Adonai vaishmurecha Ya er Adonai panavalecha vichunecha. Yisa Adonai panavalecha v'yasem lecha shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and may he grant you his peace. B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach, Sar HaShalom, in the name of Yeshua the Messiah, the Prince of Peace. Amen.